Hello. The reason why I wear this robe, it's made out of hemp, by the way. I made it myself and sewed it myself. Is because it breathes a lot, and it keeps you warm, and it is really cold. <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know what your definition of really cold is. It's like uh, 21 degrees outside. Um, it's made out of hemp, by the way, twill hemp, in case you wanted to know. Um, specifically, um, everything given wisdom and enough insight is irreducibly simple. You know how like you watch a master doing something and they make it look so easy and when you try to do it it's it's so incredibly hard and um, there's just all these little skill sets you have to have to be able to make it look easy. Everything is kinda like that. Um, the truth is also like that. The irreducible simplicity. The closer you get to the center the more simple everything becomes. It becomes extremely clear and lucid. It's like seeing the forest for the trees. You're able to see the whole picture. Everybody else is kind of lost on the road and the backwoods and the back alleys. Same is true of metaphysics, and it's also true, and I talked about this endlessly in field theory, that Mother Nature is irreducibly simple. Uh, specifically, retroduction. The apophaticism or the theurgy, there's a reason why you'll never hear me use the word meditation because meditation doesn't refer to anything. It's the most non-specific word possibly in the English language. I'll never ever use it because it's such a horrible word. Um, specifically, what original, and I, I mean that very specifically, what original Buddhism taught and what the Neoplatonists taught was theurgy. It also goes by the name Apophaticism, it goes by Neti Neti, goes by via, negati via Negativa, and the methodology of that is incredibly simplex. Everybody tries to actually use, the, and, and it's kind of funny, there's actually these two antinomies of uh, ignorant methodologies that are used by most everybody when they actually try to engage in any methodology of theurgy or fundamental basic uh, liberation and uh, what they'll do is they'll busy their mind trying to crush their thoughts so they're actually burning the fuel in their head if you will to try to crush thoughts they're using thoughts and generating thoughts to crush thoughts and it's completely impossible the only thing you're doing is stirring the pot more and then there's the other people that kind of see you know the ignorance of doing that and they do the opposite um, I hesitate to use the word stupidity, but they do the opposite dumb thing. And what they'll do is they'll blank their mind out, like a pet rock. And that's, that's not proximity. That's not bringing yourself proximal to the center, and it's not theurgy. It's not disobjectification at all. Let's just use one word, and we'll trace it back. And everybody's heard of the word Zen, right? And by the way, I have nothing to do with Zen. I'll never speak about it in a positive fashion for many countless thousands of reasons. The word Zen, Japanese word Zen, comes from the Chinese word Chanla. Yeah? And that Chinese word came from Latter day Mahayanism. Yeah? And that Sanskrit word is Dhyana. Yeah? And the earlier word used in the time of Gautama. Yeah? Is the word Janna. Yeah? So it went Zen, Channa, uh, Dhyana, and Janna. And Janna, the root word just is very apropos that I have the fake fireplace up right here. The word Janna comes from the word Jayati, which means to burn. And what is it exactly that we're burning away? We're burning away objectivity. Apophaticism via negativa. Apophaticism, <laughs> excuse me, I already said that. And neti neti is via negativa methodology is burning away objectivity. Let's use a simple analogy. And uh, I used to pan for gold because it was kind of fun. And uh, more than a few times I've panned for gold. Last time I panned for gold was in Dahlonega, Georgia. It's kind of far east of Atlanta, Georgia, by the way. Yeah, east of Atlanta, Georgia, there's this cool place up in the sticks where you could pan for gold. Everybody in the world has this thought of gold purification, right? 
like if you're mining gold and you know it has to crush the rock and you know the gold is purified let's get to the heart of the matter and this is directly relational to the metaphysics that I'm speaking of specifically theurgy gold is never ever purified yeah gold is extracted extracted from host rock extracted from conglomeration with other things gold doesn't uh, uh, isn't found in extremely few molecular forms where it actually has to be um, extracted on a much finer sense from like a molecule. Like a lot of things are not naturally occurring. They uh, occur as salts and then it has to be chemically uh, extracted. But uh, in the case of gold, all forms of ancient metaphysics refer to liberation or the soul as uh, gold. And it's nearly a perfect analogy. Not totally perfect. But gold is never purified. It's extraction. Since liberation is extraction and not purification, because, by the way, you can't purify the psychophysical. That's like saying you could polish a turd. You can't do it. Dissubjectification, or if we get to the root word once again, jayati or janna or dhyana, means to burn. But what is being burned? In the case of a fire, we're, you know, we're burning the logs we would be releasing the essence of the log, which would be the energy, right? Of course, we don't take that analogy too far because the log is turned to ashes, so we don't want to go too far with that, but we're burning away objectivity. So, since gold is never purified, it's extracted. Gold is always gold, right? You can't purify something as fundamentally gold because it's an element. It can't be purified anymore because gold is an element. It would be the foundation of something. What is potential is not actual. It is the case that genetically an acorn is identical to an oak tree, right? But you can't get any lumber out of an acorn. People always talk about, well, do human beings have free will? And that's an ignorant question because human beings have free will potentially, but they don't have it actually because it hasn't been actualized. Free will is only potential, just like a dog, for example. I mean, not that you want to do this, make an analogy. A dog has a reactive will. A dog doesn't have a proactive will or a free will. Like if you kick a dog in the butt, which of course you should never do, it's going to turn around and bite you in the leg, right? doesn't even think. It's purely reactive. There's no free will there. A lot of human beings are like that too. Purely reactive like an animal. They have no free will because it hasn't been actualized. Liberation is extraction, so if liberation is extraction, yeah, and it's burning away objectivity, and this is what is meant by the spiritual appellation of a dead man walking, therefore, retroductively and logically so, by fact of wisdom, embodiment must be dilution, right? If purification is extraction, then what would embodiment be? Embodiment would be dilution. Avidya is a condition. This primordial agnosis has no locus. It's an absence of self-reflexivity. It's seeing self and what is not self. The condition to take up the consubstantiality of what is not the self or not the soul. False identification. Consubstantiality of matter and spirit. That consubstantiality, in the case of a radio, would be the broadcast. The broadcast would, of course, be empirical consciousness. By the way, the antenna of, uh, for all life is, of course, the water molecule, which, by the way, with no coincidence, is the only incommensurable geometry in the entire universe. The only one. That's why it's tattooed right here on the back of my hand. The same, uh, and it's upside down right here in my hand, for no reason other than my, my hand oriented like this. That same triangle, the 108-36-36, is the only incommensurable geometry and also to the geometry of water. In triplicate forms the Pythagorean pentagram. But that's a matter for another discussion. We have to talk about the golden ratio, and then people love to say golden ratio, but they don't know what the golden ratio is. It's a proportionality of one to itself. Phi is the one as one is the phi is a mathematical absolute. But what does that mean? That means everything we see that's beautiful in the world is nothing other than an empirical extrapolation of the principle and the attribute, which are both one. This is the reason also, too, why the first two numbers of the Fibonacci sequence are one and one, 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 two, three, five, eight. And like I said before, the only number missing through one through five is four, which, of course, is time. Time, of course, does not exist. 
It's the reason why it's not found in the Fibonacci sequence. Every ancient culture, by the way, if you don't know this, said that time was the number four. So since embodiment is dilution and the condition that breeds, because there is no, in all forms of monism, whether it be Advaita Vedanta, original Greek uh, Platonism, earliest or original Buddhism, um, uh, no, yeah, those, those primary, with all forms of monism, there is uh, no first cause, no prima causa. There's no original sin, it's a condition. And that condition is false identity. And false identity necessitates, the Greek word anakia, by the way, which doesn't really translate as necessity, necessitates embodiment. An embodiment due to what? Embodiment due to the condition. There is no free will. Extraction, liberation, transcendence is extraction. And extraction is wisdom because in all forms of metaphysics too, the true ones anyway, wisdom and the self and the soul are one and the same thing. They're inseparable. They're inseparable, inseparable holos or unity. They're not two different things like principle and attribute, light and illumination. Light and illumination are not two different things. They're one and the same thing only distinguished by attribute. There's nothing in the universe that doesn't have at least one attribute because nothing can be without an attribute. There is nothing in this universe, real or unreal, seen or unseen, that doesn't have at least one attribute because if it didn't have an attribute, then nothing could be said about it, nothing could be known about it. Nobody would know of it. Just think about that for a second, by the way. Everything in the universe has one attribute. Even the most simplex, the agathon, the one, and uh, Pali, the word is uh, Brahma. By the way, the only time Gautam referred to his teachings with the name, he called him Brahmayana, Samyuta Nikaya 5.4. He said, I teach Brahmayana, or path to the absolute. Nothing is known except through the modality of the knower. It doesn't matter if we say Brahman. doesn't matter if we say Tat, as in the case Tatva Masi, that thou art. That with a capital T. Which, by the way, is the appellation of Tathagata. Tathagata is the two uh, words. Tat, meaning Brahman or the Absolute, i.e. the Agathon, and Agata, past tense, meaning having arrived at, uh, having come unto. In other words, you have arrived at the Absolute. This is the reason why all Pali translations that... Uh, and this is the reason why they spin those dumb silver wheels in Tibet. They're spinning the wheel. All uh, wrong translations since like the 2nd century CE said Gautama is the wheel turner. It doesn't say that at all as a Pali translator now of 20 plus. It doesn't say that. It says Gautama is that which turns the wheel. In other words, the axis, the axle, the nave, you know, the felly of the wheel that is opposite of all becoming an antinomy. It doesn't say spin the wheel. What it says is, is that which spins the wheel. In other words, standing in the position or the stasis of the absolute, which of course is uh, in counter space. Counter space, of course, is the non Cartesian antinomy of uh, everything that is phenomenal, manifest, moving, becoming. In ancient Pali, the word would be bhava nubhava, becoming and re becoming over and over and over again for all eternity. So, just like gold, which is never purified because gold is a fundamental element, it is extracted. It is extracted from dilution, and that dilution is the primordial condition of agnosis. Like I said, I'll never use the word meditation because it doesn't refer to anything. Technically, sitting on the toilet, you know, looking at the holes in the ceiling is meditation. So that's why you will never use that word. It doesn't refer to anything. I'll never answer the word, answer the question. Someone says, well, do you meditate? It's like, well, meditation doesn't mean anything. Do you mean theurgy? Then the answer is yes. But what is theurgy? What is disobjectification? Disobjectification or this retroduction of metaphysics is extracting out from dilution by erasure of the primordial condition of agnosis. That primordial condition has no locus. It has no beginning. It's not an original sin and it's not a cause. You could say it's an uncaused cause, but it's not even that. It's the extrinsic attribute of the absolute, just like light and illumination. By the way, no one ever sees light. People see illumination. Light is a principle. Light is a principle of energy. What would light be without illumination? 
Illumination is the going forth of light. Nobody has ever, not a single person on this earth has ever seen light. Light is a principle, a principle of energy. Specifically, it's a type of energy. It's a coaxial circuit, but that attributional nature of light is illumination. Illumination requires resistance because, for example, under a theoretical condition, an, invi an invisible person would be completely blind because light requires uh, capacitance, resistance, permeability and permittivity of matter in the darkest hall with a sliver of light coming through the window, that light is completely invisible until it makes manifestation due to uh, permeability or permittivity of another matter in your hand or you know, the floor or the wall. There is no original sin. Extraction requires wisdom. Wisdom is proximity. The wisdom and the self are one and the same thing. Wisdom is the self that seeks itself, but not objectively, because the self cannot be known objectively. If the self could be known objectively, that means there's something antecedent making recognition of something that you are not. This is why the only logical methodology of true monistic metaphysics is retroduction, is via negativa. That's the word jayati, which means to burn. By wisdom, you burn away objectivity. How do you find a needle in a haystack? Well, you don't go looking for a needle in a haystack. Not by wisdom you don't. You set a match to it all and poof, it's all gone. There's the needle. Perfect, perfect little example. You don't look for a needle in a haystack. You set fire to all of it, and the only thing that will be left in an instant will be that metal needle. Because the one thing that cannot be consumed and cannot be burned is the pure subject. Yeah, the pure subject that is the self. Tattva masme, aham brahmasme. Hence the word tathagata. Liberation, wisdom, and the self are different terms to refer to one and the same thing. Subjective abstraction from false identification. Subjective extraction from false identification. It's turning the acorn into an oak tree. Human beings do not have free will unless it's actualized. You can plant all the acorns in the world out in the middle of the Mojave Desert and you're not going to get anything, are you? It's like people sitting blank-minded. You know, they put on like robes like this and they'll burn incense and they'll sit there blanking their mind out. Well, that's like planting acorns in the middle of the desert. You know, they don't grow there. They need water. <laughs> they need a lot of stuff. People believe that that is something. It's like, well, I feel so peaceful. I blank my mind out and... I just feel so peaceful. Well, you do, but I mean, you could get the same thing by getting a lobotomy, you know, stick you in a care facility like in a pair of an adult diapers and turning on the cartoon network. You'll never stress for the rest of your life. You'll just like sit there drooling on yourself, eating jello and porridge, you know, watching the cartoon network, drooling on yourself. I feel so peaceful. It's like, yeah, I know you do, but what connection does that have at all? to true wisdom has anything to do with subjective extraction from false identity and it doesn't have anything to do with that. I planted a bunch of acorns in the desert. I feel so calm. <laughs> That's not what any of these ancient masters taught. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. And I believe you. It just feels so calm when I blank my mind out. I listen to my teacher and he's such a calm person. You know how many times I've heard that over the years? Those people are only calm under ideal conditions. You put them under a little bit of stress, they'll crack and they'll show you who they really are. Isn't that like a line from uh, the Joker from Batman? It's like, I'll show you these, what is it? What was that line from the Joker? It said, uh, I'll show you how these people really are. It said, uh, they'll eat each other. <laughs> That's what all these calm masters and gurus are really like. You put them under a little stress, they will crack like a madman. They will like foam at the mouth like a mad dog. I've seen it many times. I've done it intentionally many times. All you have to do is match wits with them and prove to them that they don't know anything, and that makes them mad. How dare you be smarter than me and know what the hell you're talking about? Oh, that pisses them off. 
I'm serious, it does. It really does piss them off. Anyway, just think about that uh, ancient Prakrit word, uh, jayate, which means to burn. And just think. People say, well, how do you engage in theurgy? And I said, well, think about it a second. You can't use thoughts to crush thoughts. That's, that's completely insane. You can't sit there and blank your mind out. What would disobjectification entail? Okay. It's not thought-based, and it's certainly not non-thought-based, where you just blank in your mind out like a pet rock. What would you think? It's like, why don't you just tell me? I can't tell you, because if I tell you, you're not going to get it. You have to think about that. And when you do, it's more than thinking, actually. It's transcendental. Uh, it's a transcendental logos of acknowledgement. When you have that, you'll see a, a, you know, a keyhole of light poke right through the door, and you're like, oh, there it is. I get it now. I know how to, I know where it is, and I know which direction to head. It's actually very simple. It's not simplex, but it's definitely simple. Just think about it. Instead of asking someone else to give you the answer, you need to spontaneously generate the answer yourself. What would disobjectification or theurgy or apophaticism entail? Well, it's not thinking. It's not non-thinking. You're blanking your mind out. Hmm. Disobjectification. Well, I am not the psychophysical. How do I disobjectify with that such that I'm able to extract myself out? Yeah. Because dilution is the primordial condition of uh, agnosis ravidya, which perpetuates all suffering for all time, for all people, everywhere. In other words, looking in the mirror when you're brushing your teeth in the morning and identifying with the psychophysical person or entity that's in the mirror. That is nami soata, not my soul. When you say my soul, too, that's also incorrect because my soul implies a possession, like I have a soul. Well, a body doesn't have a soul any more than a radio has a signal in it. That, however, is not a denial of the soul, nor is it a denial of the signal. It's the consubstantiality of the two which manifests as the broadcast, or in the case of a human being, an empirical consciousness. That consciousness is exactly like a broadcast, because a broadcast is not the signal. The broadcast is the consubstantiality of the signal and the radio. That's the broadcast. Anyway, I hope it gives you something to think about. You actually have to really want it and think about it yourself. Just giving somebody the answers is actually not helpful. You could say it's not this and not that. Oh, wait, that must be where we get the words netty netty from. Not this, not that. It's exactly where we get it from. Since it cannot be known objectively, it is only truly known in the absolute sense of known, not empirical knowledge, i.e. wisdom, by disobjectification. When you push away of all the things that is not, clarity is manifest. And that's about the most accurate explanation anybody could give. Anyway, thanks for watching, and goodbye.